Have you had a D&D game ruined by a player with only good roles? Sort of. See, my wife and I visited a college friend and his wife, with whom we're very close, but whom we don't see very often. He was running a solo campaign for her, and I was the one who introduced him to D&D in the first place. My wife, however, had never played, and we didn't have time to fully initiate her. So I took over one of the two DMPCs, and she watched while we went through a dungeon. I rolled pretty well, as I often do, and used some tactics that the rules probably didn't fully anticipate, as I often do, but nothing especially noteworthy. Then we came upon a dragon, and my friend asked my wife if she'd like to roll for the dragon. The dragon proceeded to miss the PCs almost every single time, culminating in crushing itself to death when it tried to pick up a massive statue to drop on our heads. My wife rolled a natural one, followed by a second natural one resulting in the dragon getting its wing fouled on some dungeon architecture and falling such that it somehow landed under the statue. The boss fight of the entire dungeon wound up being the sort of thing you might imagine being set to Benny Hill music. And I'm pretty sure our friend burned those dice and has never let my wife handle any of his dice again. My last campaign had three especially good roles that ruined or foiled entire encounters, or altered whole subplots, but unfortunately, the DM was smart enough to roll with it and turn them into hilarious moments of awesome. For context, our group is more into comic swashbuckling than serious campaigning, and realism or balance pretty much always take a backseat to a fun story. So I was playing a mage character with no magic skills. Literally, she was a sorceress that knew only one cantrip, a homebrew we called Scary Lights, that did no damage, but triggered an intimidation check. The purpose of the character was to be a charlatan, she said she was a witch, but mainly just used trickery for everything. We were in a dungeon we weren't supposed to be in at our level, maybe level 2 at this point, descending a long, rickety spiral staircase. A large group of goblins riding giant spiders descends on silken strands to try and knock us from the stairs into the gaping chasm below. My character, Chichu, casts the only spell she knows, the useless, scary lights. Nat 20. Roll for crit? Nat 20. The spiders, terrified of my immense power, try to bolt, and the goblins are so spooked they drop their harnesses to cover their eyes. The entire encounter worth of baddies either falls to their deaths or flees back up the spider threads in terror, and our low-level group picks up the cache of mithril bars at the bottom of the cave, and is rolling deep for the rest of the game. The rest of the group, who are not aware that Chi Chu has zero magical talent, become convinced of her awesome powers, and start sending her into battle at the front of the pack, to ongoing hilarious effect. Eventually leading the character to TPK the party due to an unfortunate mishap with a demon possession. <laughs> Oops. The second epically good role was at a point where the party was supposed to get arrested by town guards and imprisoned by the big bad. Still very low level, 15 town guards should have been plenty more than the 5 of us could handle. DM expects us to go quietly. Our half-orc fighter will have none of this. He decides to intimidate the lot of them by whipping out his half-orc manhood to waggle at them. Said manhood was still of indeterminate size when the die was cast. Nat 20. The guards, ashamed in the presence of his knee-length python, decided they would all rather not mess with us and leave to drink and console themselves. We don't go to prison. We find out later, in a bar filled with sulking guards that kept looking at us askance, that the prison cells were supposed to be an intro to a character we needed to meet, and ended up sneaking in instead. The last epic role was a survival check. The group was in our starting town after some time afield. It should have been a friendly hometown, but Chichu, who was a kleptomaniac miscreant in addition to a charlatan, had alienated the innkeeper and gotten herself banned from the village inn, so she was forced to sleep on the outskirts of town, ostensibly in the cold, damp, rolling survival checks to find out her level of exhaustion, nat 20. Chichu builds herself a great hall in her own honor. Hey DM, what happens if I roll another one? Roll another? Your new house has Wi-Fi. Nat 20. I took my vengeance on the town innkeeper by opening my fancy new home as a competing inn, getting him arrested on the conspiracy charges, looting his inn in the middle of the night for furnishings for my own, and then burning it down to hide the theft as he watched from his jail cell across the street. Chichu became a wealthy business owner. The whole town economy shifted with the miracle of Wi-Fi. Innkeeper's whole family became enemies of the party, working to bring us down everywhere we went. A good DM rolls with the rolls. We have a player who constantly lies about her rolls. The DM has chosen to handle it by allowing the character to avoid taking damage and getting the occasional new magic item, but the character has no story and nothing interesting happens to the character. 
Fortunately, this player does not actually participate much in the game, so the other players are able to play around this character and keep this character mostly in the background. I suspect if this player were more obnoxious or threw her character's weight around, the DM would give her a talking to quick, fast, and in a hurry. But since the player is just risk avoidant, the DM is willing to tolerate it, and the rest of us understanding what's going on without the DM having to explain anything to us. The closest thing to this was when one player rolled three 20s in a row and I didn't want to accept the results. So I pretended to roll and announced that the other three players had to roll as well. Every single roll was a 20. On my chart this meant that the gem they'd found was well, well over a million gold. It was definitely possible for them to find a buyer who would give them half a million and that would have really messed up the game. So I got creative. I declared that the jeweler they'd had to value at the gym said it was beyond his ability to say what it was worth, but there was this elf. They found the elf, and he judged the value of the gym at 20 million gold. There's no one on the continent who could pay even half that, so they were seriously bummed. But, said the half-elf, this could be used in a portal. You just need another one at least half as good to go with it. So, they had an obscenely valuable gym, and a goal. About a month later, I let them find a gym valued at over 10 million. By this time, they had two hangouts, one small castle, and the other an inn they'd won in a duel. These were about two weeks apart in good weather, and they hated the game time spent traveling between them. So they went back to the elf who called on a friend, and they set up the best gym in the castle and the other in the inn, making a portal directly between the two. Not only did this solve the problem of that ridiculous string of die rolls, it sped up play because they didn't have to burn game time traveling between hangouts. I once played a game in which the player ruined the game on the very first encounter of that game. The party started out on a campaign and came to a bridge with a dwarf standing by the bridge. The party leader heads over to talk to the dwarf while the rest of the party holds back. The dwarf morphs into some tentacled monster, I forget what type of monster exactly, and wraps some of its tentacles around the party leader. Now the party mage whips out his wand of wonder and casts at the monster. The GM just stares at him for a second and tells him to roll to determine the random effect. The DM then says a fireball shoots out of the wand engulfing the monster and the party leader. I was just shooting at the monster. The monster is wrapped around the leader. How did you expect to hit just the monster? Now, roll for damage. The mage rolls and the DM tells him, that's the best roll I've ever seen for fireballs. Congratulations, you just killed the leader, but the monster's still alive. Yes, I used to make very complicated bosses that required lots and lots of strategy and a number of die rolls were pretty enormous. My creatures didn't have lots of HP, for a boss that is, but were hard to touch and required skill checks to counter some of their abilities. But anyway, off to the crispy part. I was once deeming a one-shot I made during a local event. The players were good. One of them seemed to have tricked die because he would often roll a natural 20, or high numbers, 18 or 19 that is. At first he ruined most of my puzzles by using an ability of his. I must mention that he played an engineer character that knew a lot about dungeon manufacturing. Then, he just swooped entire groups of enemies with his magic and buffs. It was annoying, but sport. He didn't cheat the whole game. Finally came the final boss, a huge adult dragon. As always, he buffed his teammates, imprisoned the dragon with some sort of device made for trapping them, he rolled a natural 20, and they proceeded to annihilate my poor dragon in only two turns. I still remember this game, as if I played it yesterday, and it was so impressive to see a player that literally rolled over the scenario. Unfortunately, I totally had a game ruined by players with only good roles. I've spent time trying to learn to improvise better in the event that this sort of thing happens again, but in back in college, there was a player who consistently rolled well, to a point to where they killed my big bad evil guy, thus trashing six weeks of dedicated GM prep. Not their fault, of course, they had rolled that string of good rolls fair and square, but it was surprising to me. I feel like I learned from it. Failure can make the game better. Seeing a player only get good rolls and trash my prep hammered that lesson home to me in a big way. Part of the enjoyable thing about gaming is watching characters grow and improve, watching them bounce back from failure. And if they never fail, where's the conflict? To try and ease up on this, I gently ask players to let me do rolls for them for a little bit, if only in the mad hope that there might be a bit more variety in the results. That did help a bit. I did have to fudge things a bit to get my game back on track role-wise, which I hate doing, because I don't like robbing players of their good rolls. I just didn't want to have to improv on something that had taken six weeks of hard work. It did encourage me to try and structure my adventures a bit more carefully so that the string of good rolls doesn't necessarily eliminate my BBEGs, which is tough. But it was certainly a learning experience. 
One of the ways I learned to counter player with only good rolls was to temporarily separate the party and put the good rolling player's character in a random encounter or two in order to wear them out a bit. It got the good rolling player a bit of extra attention, and it softened his PC to where it wasn't immune to the villainous machinations. Everyone seemed happy with that particular solution. Yes and no. I don't rely all that heavily upon rolling, since it's usually not the best option. If you want a purely random event, then sure, but usually you don't want a purely random event. Normally you want chaos, something which is logically reasonable which follows an ordered structure but isn't predictable. To that end, usually your ideal method is to let the players decide what they want to do and they'll screw stuff up far more effectively than the dice ever could. But there's always an exception. In this case, it was a game ruined by a player with only good rolls, in the sense that he was blatantly obviously cheating. Like he'd hide the dice, roll them, and be like, uh, um, uh, 20. And it was blatantly obvious when he was trying to come up with a fake roll because he'd just sit there going, uh, uh, for like 5 to 10 seconds straight at a time, staring at the die roll, the fact that he never rolled under an 18 also kind of gave it away, as did the fact that when he actually did roll well for realsies, he was all proud of it and showed the die and instantly read it off without having to bullshit up a fake number. The rolls didn't affect the game much, at least not mechanically, but it did irritate everyone else at the table to the point that it was really sucking a lot of the fun out of the game. Not to mention any time he rolled under an 18, he had to sit there like an idiot and stammer for a while trying to come up with a plausible, in his mind, lie. That being said, I have had players who did roll exceedingly high with frightening regularity. To some degree, it caused some balance issues, but nothing I couldn't compensate for by giving other characters a little nudge here and there with items or bonuses to tweak things slightly more in their favor. Even so, there was one game I was a player in that we had a boss fight that was critical something. Every single person rolled either a critical success or critical failures for like the first five rounds of combat, the NPCs and the players. It was kind of absurd, and it was mostly failures. And since it was so many ones in a row for everyone, the GM just ran with it, and eventually everyone had basically dropped their weapons, the giant spider boss somehow tripped and flipped itself over on its back, and a tree fell on it. It was, well, it was definitely an epic boss battle, though not the way it was intended to be. Generally speaking, though, a string of lucky rolls doesn't tend to break a game unless you're relying way, way too heavily on dice in general. Then again, that's kind of how the rules are printed. Roll dice for absolutely everything. Fortunately, it's exceedingly rare for a DM to actually use the rules as printed.